I think I think there's so many treatment options, and again, I think everybody, I think we're all on the same page, is that this is about uh, maximizing care for the patient, prolonging life, maintaining quality of life as well. And, and again, I think there, especially for these high-grade young patients, it's like you said, Steve, we have to throw everything at them. We have to throw the kitchen sink at them. And I think basically when I see these patients, I talk about local control in the pelvis, but, but obviously uh, uh, for systemic disease. So, um, but, but we all know that 70, 75 percent of the patients do well with definitive therapy, and hopefully we've achieved a cure. And however, 25, 30 percent of patients will have a, an early biochemical recurrence as manifested by a rise in their PSA. Uh, Steve, you've published data about the, the timing of PSA recurrence, especially after radical prostatectomy, uh, Gleason, Gleason at the time of diagnosis, uh, when, when it started to go up, the doubling time and those things. And so all of us see these patients. We know that traditionally, uh, once the PSA starts to go up, most of us uh, do imaging and the next uh, order of business for most of these uh, patients is the institution of androgen deprivation therapy. Uh, Dr. Crawford, you've, you've done a ton of work on, on androgen deprivation therapy. Can you uh, give us some historical perspective, if you will, and, and where you think we need to be moving with that? Because again, that is generally for the advancing patient, the first line uh, that most urologists offer. Well, you know, things have changed in the past uh, couple decades. Uh, advanced prostate cancer, you know, was metastatic disease, newly diagnosed, we use androgen deprivation therapy. Now, um, as we just alluded to, some 60 to 80,000 men each year have biochemical failure. And, you know, the first, as, as we all well know, PSA stands for patient stimulated anxiety, physician stimulated anxiety, we want to do something. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any studies that tell us, the, the uh, pl placebo controlled studies that tell us the intervention does anything, yet we all do it. Uh, and they've been tried, believe me, these studies have been tried, but PSA has kind of ruined that. As far as androgen deprivation therapy, I, we'll probably talk about that in a couple minutes, but um, we've, we've made some progress in that arena too uh, with newer agents that are antagonists and not agonists. Um, you know, this whole thing about combined androgen blockade, um, I think uh, what we did years ago, n now it's, uh, it's really been solidified with the fact that uh, we, we're seeing that testosterone is king as we look at some of these new drugs, abiraterone and other things to lower it. So, you know, this, the whole idea is if you're going to do androgen deprivation therapy, you ought to do it right. And if your goal is to get testosterone down, then get it down and do it with the right agent. I agree, except we cannot overlook the fact that we can salvage some of these patients uh, without the need of progressing to androgen deprivation therapy. And we cannot underestimate the role of adjuvant radiation therapy after radical prostatectomy, the role of salvage therapy in the form of, of uh, uh, salvage prostatectomy or even cryotherapy or even outside the country uh, salvage HIFU. So we can't overlook the fact that we may salvage some of these patients prior to the initiation of androgen deprivation therapy. Yeah, absolutely. I think, again, I think the, the technology, the advances really allow us to, to move in that direction. And, and again, I think we, as, as again, the, the practitioners, the physicians that are managing these patients, we need to have all of, all of those arrows in our quiver, if you will, in order to, to hopefully, again, prolong survival, but again, a lot of this is also maintenance of quality of life because some of these therapies, especially, uh, you know, when we start to get into the hormonal manipulation, uh, you know, really do have a lot of side effects. Uh, you know, Dr. Quinn, it's, it's always been this definition of, of testosterone less than 50, which defines castration. Can you comment on that and, and, and where, where you think we need to be moving with that? And, well, I think we need to remember that when we started doing the testosterone assays in, in, the, in the 80s, we couldn't measure below, actually we couldn't measure below 65 at one stage, and then 50 became a, a cutoff at, at which it was relatively undetectable and nominally became the castrate level. 
So what we now can do is, is measure fairly easily uh, down to, to 10 or 12. A lot of, lot of uh, places have that as their, their lower limit. And the question is whether lowering the testosterone initially makes a difference. Uh, I was a skeptic on this, but uh, we recently had data presented uh, looking at the uh, the antagonist, the LHRH antagonist, suggesting that uh, there may be a benefit to at least starting with them and using uh, maintenance, uh, maintenance agonist therapy. Uh, so I, I think that's a question. The issue of how low to go with the testosterone has been made a little bit more complicated lately because we have data from uh, one of the abiraterone studies that shows that if the tes testosterone is lower uh, after therapy, uh, then you won't, you won't, uh, you won't survive uh, as long. Now there's not a big difference, uh, but I think this is complicated and our approach to hormone therapy may actually be altered uh, now uh, with an argument for us rather than starting with uh, combined androgen blockade, uh, starting with, with uh, one of the antagonists and, and then potentially switching across because you want a, a bigger interval than one month to treat your patient and uh, also to avoid some of the other issues with that therapy. Uh, Steve? In terms of the evolving, I mean, I agree with, with Dr. Quinn. I, I think in terms of evolving, and this was actually mentioned earlier, is that we may be going to shorter periods of ADT, but more intensive ADT. And this is not yet approved, but thinking about the abiraterones of the world and zalutamides, moving them up into first-line therapy, and that we may be able to actually cure some of these patients. For example, there's a study where they looked at men with high-risk disease undergoing radical prostatectomy, and they got six months of ADT plus abiraterone. And what they actually showed, and when this had been done before with AD, standard ADT and chemo, about 5% of the patients had a complete response. Now you substitute abiraterone, it's about 25% of the patients, one out of four, almost one out of three, had a complete response um, with six months of this intensive ADT. So I think that, in thinking maybe in five, 10 years, where are we going? I think, for me, that's where I see things going.